My name is Daniel Bryant and I am working on my project for BAAS 409 Global Technology and Society. My research project is Lessons Learned from the Exxon Valdez. For this project, my interview person is Wayne Roberts, who is the Director of Environmental and Regulatory Compliance at Plains All-American Pipeline, which is a crude oil transportation pipeline. In this capacity, he's, uh, well, I'll just let you tell it, Wayne. What exactly does your job entail that can relate to our topic discussion? Well, it certainly relates to the topic, Daniel. I'm the Director of Environmental and Regulatory Compliance for Plains here in the Southwestern Division and Southern Division also, so we, we're directly responsible for responding to uh, a significant spill or incident like this. So and that certainly falls within the scope of your, of your course. Well, and one thing that, uh, that I did want to discuss with you today is, of course, we're discussing lessons learned from the Exxon Valdez. Right. Obviously, there was a uh, massive spill up in Prince William Sound uh, just 20 years ago, a few weeks ago, uh, which was very devastating to the environment out there. Uh, through the course of that, there were many things that weren't followed, in court, uh, including uh, emergency response plans, uh, the training, everything else like this. One of the questions that I have is how does you and your company prepare for these type of incidents? What sort of training do you have in place? Well, that's that's a key 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 word I think is training. What we do, we have a in order to be ready for a significant occurrence like this, we we first of all have a very detailed and comprehensive response plan in place and that's engineered and, and, and reviewed and, and, and reiterated to, to be as comprehensive and you know provide all, all the details of coverage that we we can possibly encounter. Then that plan is actually sent to PIMSA, EPA, and other agencies for review, and it's approved. And we actually have to, every five years we have to re, we send it in for another review process. But so it's pretty pretty well established uh, as far as guidelines and and the, the the plan for how we're going to respond. And then we train to that plan. And, the, and you, you said the keyword training. We train to that plan, and we do that by actual deployment drills where we actually you know deploy the the equipment. We also have mock scenarios that we train to, you know, tabletop exercises, but the, the key word is training to, to that plan and knowing what to do in the event of such a, such a spill. So that's how we do it. Have you ever had to respond to such a spill uh, where you've had a spill into a navigable water of the U.S.? Unfortunately, yes, I have several <laughs> times. The most recent being the Pecos River spill back at the end of 04 and the start of 05, but yes, yes, we have. We sure have. And during that, what was one of the biggest obstacles you had to overcome during emergency response in the remediation phase? What was the, where was the biggest breakdown, or it, did it just well, all run smooth from day one? Well, it never runs completely smooth. The biggest problem with emergency response is uh, you're, you're so keyed into responding and mitigating, you know, containing the oil or whatever. That's your focus, of course, and it should be. But the, the, the problem is you can often do more harm than you do good in, in that response. You have to be very careful. You're, you're trying to get to the containment, you know, secure the area, uh, protect the environment as well as the public. And in that process, you know, you sometimes you have to really be careful not to damage the other ecosystems that are there already, you know, that you have to work around. So that's really the biggest barrier that, that, we, that we encounter. For example, you can't just take off carte blanche with a bulldozer and bull, bulldoze down trees and, 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 and destroy the, the environment just to get enough dirt to push up a berm to contain the oil, that kind of thing. So you have to work around those things. And that's really the biggest obstacle you run into during the response phase is even later in, in remediation, the same thing. You really have to be careful. And during these response phases, uh, did you ever have any problems interacting with government regulatories that caused any problems for uh, response personnel? No, not really problems. Uh, I've been very lucky, I guess, in that respect. I've, I've always been able to work well with the agencies. And I think the key to that is is being uh, initially, for instance, in the Pecos River spill, the, the you know the EPA on scene commander arrived, you know, right, right away, a lady, and, and we initially established a good rapport and kind of laid out what was expected of each other. We knew what our roles were, and uh, and, and we you know and then we stayed within those constraints. And I think if you don't, then you will have trouble. But I've been very fortunate. You know, I've never had an, an agency actually been a, be a hindrance to the response or remediation, but I think the key is, you know, establishing that, that, that good that rapport right, right up, right up front, and that communication, yeah, and, and, and letting each other know, you know, because they're there, they're there to do a job and, and you're there to do your job, so you just work together to get the job done. And in these significant spills that you've had, have there been any long-term lasting ramifications on the environment or have you been able to been successful in remediating these spills? 
we've been very successful uh, in, in all of in all cases in getting the, you know getting the environment back actually to better condition than it was initially. I mean, you start with the background that you have, and, and we've actually improved it, so to speak. Certainly, in the Pecos River incident, we had a couple of years, but we, we finally, and actually, in that case, the, 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 the ranch land, the sheep ranching land, and the shoreline was restored to a better condition than, than we found it. So, yeah, we, we had good luck in that respect. I would imagine that you have quite a bit of government regulatory <laughs> interaction on <laughs> yeah, those yes, type things. Yes. Uh, one of the things about the Exxon Valdez spill, spill that most people do not know is that Exxon was not actually responsible for responding to uh, spills in Prince William Sound. There was a consortium of several companies together that was uh, Alyeska. During the process, they kind of faded out of the picture and Exxon responded in full force. It caused problems with the regulatory agencies who were concerned about a couple of things. One is they were concerned about the legal authority of Exxon to actually respond since that was not according to the emergency response plan. The second of which is the government authorities were reluctant to approve anything outside of manual recovery just because this was such a high profile incident that they were being watched. How do you think that this failed, uh, this breakdown in the communication and the reluctance on the regulatory agencies to approve anything, how do you think that that hindered cleanup operations? Well, it, it had to be a big hindrance. I mean, I know it was from, from looking back at the incident, but there again it goes back to uh, not being a, not having a, a good response guideline in place and then you know, when, when the agencies come in, you're, you're just, it's chaos, so you're actually fighting each other and, and, you, and you've, got to, you've got to have that good incident command system in place, the structure, and keep it structured for that reason and, and, and I know the, the, in, in that case, you know, the uh, responsible party was not clearly identified and, and, and that has to be uh, done right up front, you know, at the very start, so uh, the failure to do that and then, if, like we were talking before about the interaction with the agencies, if you don't establish that initially, it's, it's just, it just continues to break down. I, I know that happened with the Valdez incident. Yeah. And with the Valdez incident, they had, uh, Exxon had tried to use dispersants to kind of disperse the oil down there, and they had also uh, attempted to do some limited burns. The weather was good for the first two days of response activities, but they recovered very little crude oil, and they had reluctance from these government agencies uh, to do these alternate methods of uh, uh, cleanup out there to try and mitigate the problem before it gets worse. The third day, a big storm ran in and uh, caused the oil to spread across the entire sound, which really caused a big catastrophe. In significant incidents like this, should the government approve alternate forms of uh, containment and uh, recovery? I think so. I, I think uh, recovery, of course, is is always you know first choice. But in some cases like this, I think they should allow some other alternate method of of, of mitigation. For instance, uh, in this case, uh, you know, they wouldn't allow burning, and I'm not sure it would have been proper, but, but there, there needs to be some other uh, method, you know, available. And prescribed burns are, I think, uh, a, a viable method. And in and, and years past, even before Open 90 was, came about, uh, in, in the local localized uh, areas in the gathering systems, we had situations where a spill would get on a little little creek, not, not, not a navigable waterway, but a little creek or a tributary, and it would be so remote or the train would be so rough or so, you know, uh, bad that you couldn't get any kind of recovery equipment in there, a, a vacuum truck or a portable equipment. So in those cases, a few times we were allowed to do a prescribed burn, and, and really it, it's, a, it's a very viable method and allows you to remove the hydrocarbon. There's a little bit of, you know, slight air emissions involved, and, and of course you got to be careful with with where the fires are, but anyway, uh, bottom line is there, there should be some other methods allowed. I would think anything, the, the speed is of the essence exactly, in that type exactly. situation, and, and I think that's where they failed in the Exxon and, Valdez. And, and like you mentioned, there are some, some chemicals now, of course they have to be EPA approved, of course, but there's dispersants or surfactants that would, would you know, that would encapsulate the oil or, or help, help the effort somewhat. Yeah. 